Cheryl has joined us here. Uh, thanks for coming by, Cheryl. Great report. This is a world that none of us really knew anything about. Well, it's so amazing. You know, I was sitting in church that morning, Sunday morning, and uh, all of a sudden this boat of tourists <laughs> floats by, and they're all taking pictures, and they're looking at me going, what's that white woman doing on a boat with, you know, Vietnamese people here in a floating village in Cambodia? And I was just chuckling to myself. I felt a little bit like an animal in a zoo, and I wondered how they take that all the time. They're so poor, and all these rich white tourists are, you know, shuffling through on tourist boats and everything. It's just, it's just well, these the are thing. These are stateless Vietnamese living in, on a lake 24-7 mm -hmm. in Cambodia. How, how did that ever come about? So yeah, it's been hundreds of years actually. You know, people came there to fish and started living there. Lots of people have also come to Cambodia hoping for a better life. But I mean, I think this is pretty ancient, you know. They've been there for quite a long time and over the years kids are born on the boat but they don't get papers. And the Vietnamese are really hated in Cambodia. There's really bad blood between Cambodians and Vietnamese that goes back, you know, hundreds of years basically. So the Cambodian government doesn't want to give them any papers and uh, it's a complicated process, it's an expensive process. So because they don't have papers, they often can't get an education. Well, where are they going to go to school? Usually on the lake. But even if they could go to shore, they can't get an education, they can't get medical care, they can't get decent jobs. So so year, you know, generation after generation, this poverty just keeps happening, and there's no hope. I think that's the hardest thing. You know, you know how you might want to make a better life for your kids if you grew up poor, and so you work really hard and try to send them to college or university or you know get them a good job or an internship. That doesn't. There's no hope for that mm. because they they don't get an education. Most of the people in this village were illiterate. I don't know if you saw Kim. She was teaching from a picture book. That was her sermon for everyone. And she uses picture books because they're still mostly illiterate, and that's a way to help them understand the message. So are they essentially trapped in this community? They yeah. can't go and anywhere else. This isn't just on the water. I mean, this is all across Cambodia. The Vietnamese that are living there, uh, you know, just have no hope for lives. And, uh, you know, later on, we might talk a little bit about selling their kids, but they're just in a desperate situation with you, no you hope. You refer to villages. These are villages of boats? Isn't that crazy? So yeah. yeah, there's 40 villages on that lake and they all have names. That one was Camp on Klang. And, 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 and do they anchor there? Like how, they, how do they? They actually move, move because we were there in the low season. So it, when you saw us going down the river first mm -hmm. to go out to the village, there was all these houses on stilts. In the high season, the water's right up to those houses. And so they move up and down the river with the tide and where the water is. Sometimes they're in the river and sometimes they're on the lake. Now they're very dependent on the fish for food. I mean, I don't know if they're able to get other agricultural products. Uh, yeah, there's stores there. On it's mostly there. fish. I mean, there are little stores. Some of those little boats are little stores. Well, we were there. Uh, we went to visit one family and they bought us some pop, which of course you feel you don't want to take because they're so desperately poor, but you can't offer them money. And it's just one of those awkward situations. You've been in that in yeah. Africa where yeah. you're trying to be gracious, but you're like, no, 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 don't yeah. spend any of your money on me, you know? So, I mean, they do have stores and they, but really they just survive on fish. And, and some of them spend their whole lives on the water. Like I, I, I was asking you while the pro, uh, before the program, uh, where do these kids play? I mean, what, uh, they don't play football, obviously. Yeah, I know. It's what so they interesting. Do? They don't really get a lot of exercise. You yeah. know, I mean, I'm sure there's times that they've been on land when they're on the river or whatever. They, you know, but generally they don't have any place to run or play. So what's really funny is uh, when church was over that morning, they moved all the tears away, and the kids just started wailing up and down the church. And I'm trying to do interviews, what? and you just have like all these kids, whoop, whoop, <laughs> going back and forth. Now the church is that like a big f a barge? It's a big barge, and yeah. it's the biggest thing they have. So yeah. it's the only place they can run. They just love it. It's so fun for uh, them. I want to talk about the kids. But, can, can, but, before we leave the fish, yeah. were you not impressed? We were talking about the Ten Commandments in the green room this right. morning. Interesting conversation. Here is a new faith community taking steps of obedience, mm -hmm. not fishing on Sunday, and bringing in, this is such a biblical picture, bringing in more fish in six days because they've chosen to obey God and, and, and having all they need mm -hmm. where they thought they would be compromised by not fishing on Sunday. I mean, that's beautiful. So what, what they're trying to do here is uh, capture the concept of a day of rest. Yeah, a and, Sabbath. and basically, you know, it's, uh, I think what struck me is the simplicity of their faith. You know, we, we here have so much and we can spend time arguing tiny theological points, you know, but in the third world, the developing world, people do not have that opportunity. It's very simple. And in a sense, you know, when you need a miracle, that's when you get a miracle. We don't have to pray for miracles here so many times because we are our own resources until we hit the wall and something happens in our life. So his daughter was sick and he prayed to other gods before he became a Christian and it didn't help and she had fevers and it was, they were really worried she was gonna die. And after he became a Christian, he thought he'd try God 
and God healed his daughter. You know, he stopped fishing because they taught him Sunday should be a day of rest, and God blessed him with more fish in six days than he had seven. So it's the simplicity of faith that I think is so yeah. beautiful. And it's terrific that Crossroads have connected with this ministry and uh, are one of the few ministries, Crossroads being that ministry in the world that is assisting them in what they're doing. And again, kudos to our, our viewers. Well, you know what's so cool about that is because a lot of ministries will not help the Vietnamese in Cambodia because the Cambodian government doesn't want the Vietnamese to be helped. Again, there's that whole animosity there. Um, Vietnam doesn't want to take them back. Cambodia doesn't want them there. And so you've got this whole thing where some, a lot of ministries are afraid they'll be kicked out of the country. Talk about the alien. Mm, and really? and that's, really? why, that's why Kim was saying thank you to Crossroads viewers, thank you to Crossroads, because you're one of the few people who will actually reach out to these people. Well, the call of the scriptures is to care for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Those are the three uh, sort of entry-level justice-seeking components in uh, biblical prophetic uh, uh, literature. And um, these people certainly qualify as aliens. Now, let's just shift here for a minute. You're going to be bringing us more reports from Cambodia. Mm -hmm. But one of the most disturbing things that's come out of this is your exposure to... Um, little girls and some little boys as well being sold uh, into the sex trade. Tell us a bit about that. You know, it was, uh, for me it was such an answer to prayer to go because for at least three or four years I've been asking God to, to find a way to let me help these little kids because it's the issue that's most gripped my heart. I can't think of anything that God would be more passionate about than little girls who are being abused, you know, by grown-ups. It's just, it's just the worst. So um, it was an emotional thing for me to go there and it was an emotional thing for me to see. Uh, it was amazing that I got to interview, first of all, the people who rescue these kids, you know, International Justice Mission, we support them as well. Crossroads Missions is currently in that work. Um, incredibly brave people, incredibly hard work. And then to sit down with kids that were rescued, some of them that I recognized, uh, there was a Dateline NBC special years ago called Kids for Sale. Many of those kids were rescued out of the brothel in that, actually on that show. And I've been praying for those kids for years. So how surreal was it for me to be sitting across from this kid I've been praying for for years and just with tears, you know, watching that story, just saying, God, can you redeem this life? And these little kids are Christians and they're praying for me and they're on fire and they wanna, they wanna work in this area of child sexual uh, rehabilitation. They wanna help kids, they wanna rescue kids, they wanna stop trafficking. They're passionate about this issue. And uh, it's amazing to see what God's doing in their life. They're becoming restored. I went to one of their soccer games and sat with them and cheered them on. Like, how surreal is that? New mm. life. Mm. And yet, uh, when you are exposed to this, uh, this underworld of uh, human trafficking in the lives of children, uh, it's, it's, it's beyond anger. I mean, it, it's got to be one of the most heartbreaking, uh, gut-wrenching things on the planet. And uh, to know that there are ministries working among these little kids is a, is a comfort, but so much needs to be done, right? Oh, you know, I spent some time in Spypak, which is one of the towns where kids are regularly sold. And uh, we have a kids club, that, you know, we support a kids club there and we'll be doing more work in that village uh, in, the, in the months to come. And um, there's a lot of kids that are there that are still being sold. And so I'm watching this kids club and the people that work there are saying, see that little girl over there? She's uh, really popular with the pedophiles and uh, someday she, yeah. she comes in and she's in so much pain that she can't even sit. Can't sit. You know, the Bible and says we're to expose sin. And yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. so thankful, yeah. Cheryl, yeah. for what you've been able to do. ABC, Monday night, uh, Dan Harris reported on Amazon fishing trips, uh, for Americans primarily, where girls as young as 13 are being offered cleaning jobs on these boats. And what, you, what it's really about is fishing with benefits. Uh, yeah. And then, of course, once they've been violated, the families are rejecting them. This is a global issue. It is a global issue. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a gripper. Well, thanks, Cheryl. We'll look forward to further reports from Cambodia. Thanks for coming our way. Yeah.